Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. I start this presentation with a photo of my granddaughter, then end with me and my father. This is our human order of sociological hierarchy. Apply it to nature and your ecological connections begin. Hierarchies exist in natural systems where this branching structure is not immediately apparent. We can see trees that overtop certain species which are also trees, but those intermediate species are often dependent on the shade produced by the overstory species. The same is applied to the shrubs under them all, and the surface plants thriving beneath these. These hierarchies are broadly applied to the concepts of how we consider even the arrangement of this natural world. Mm, where do we start? This starting point receives our attention to articulate ecological organization. In this series, we will explore the interrelatedness each level of ecological organization has with the layers above and below it. Sometimes it seems impossible to consistently define importance of sunlight energies separate from the water delivery to a plant or animal. Interdependence is obligatory for each organism. We pivot on the concept of the biosphere, articulated through biomes, and definitions that give meaning first to plants and by extension the animals who rely on these natural energy capturing factories. I will often revisit this simple truth of life on Earth. The sun is the source of energy that all terrestrial life relies on. Without that photonic energy filtered through our atmosphere and captured by photosynthesizing plants, we would have nothing of significance we know of as this third rock from the sun. Third rock from the sun. I never got that till now. Earth is the water planet. Although 40% of Earth's population lives within or near coastal regions, the ocean impacts people everywhere. Most of Earth's water is stored in the ocean, a driving force for weather and climate. Conceptual arrangements put ideas into order from largest to smallest. However, the interconnections between them all is incontrovertible. Everything is integrated into this process of living, thriving and surviving. The common event found here is movement. This causes consequences of passage through major evolutionary forces affected by social systems, growth forms, seasonality, habitat, and many ecological and behavioral parameters. Movement has consequences for individuals as well as for populations and communities. Its effects on species fitness are ultimately the selecting forces for dispersal, migration, and exploration that affects distribution, abundance, and dispersion of individuals. Throughout this series, we will revisit this seven-step hierarchy to recognize this interconnectedness. We have seen the list of words and now put some branding on this jersey. We begin by asking what are the levels of organization within the biosphere? From smallest to largest, most exclusive to the most inclusive, we have individual, population, community, ecosystem, landscape, biome, and biosphere. The understanding of an individual is very obvious. It can be a shrub, a tree, a deer, or elk. This is where we see a single living entity. Add in the other members of the same species and we have a population. Now integrate different populations together on the same physical site and we get a community. Sometimes it is the buffalo and elk together. Other times, wolves and grizzly bears interact on the same site and at the same time. <laughs> in this case, it was three species coming together. The bear had some company before the wolf came to lunch. These are sensible and clear interactions. A population is a group of individuals within the same species, within the same area, that are capable of reproducing with one another. We will revisit this obligatory situation of what makes a species in terms of the ability to mate with another member of the same species and produce viable offspring. 
that is to make offspring that can also mate and produce viable offspring. Of course, time is a compulsory factor to include. A community is defined as populations of two or more species within the same geographical area and within the same time period. Temporally, they are placed in the spatial area. Interactions happen here. An ecosystem is a biotic community along with its abiotic, or non-living components, such as water, air, minerals, and nutrients. A biome is a large ecological area with similar climatic conditions. A biome can have multiple ecosystems within it. The biome receives ample attention in our ecological study because it carries the water on how relationships form dependencies. The biosphere is the portion of Earth in which all known life forms exist. It occupies a thin layer of air, the atmosphere, water, the hydrosphere, and land, the lithosphere. A fourth component, the biosphere, is that portion of Earth's system containing life. This life is dependent on all three Earth physical components. We live on a unique world. This combination is probably replicated in this universe, but mm, so far we have not found another. The soil environment is a primary component of the global biochemical cycle. We keep looping back to this image of the big three, so let's make sure we can capture the meanings of each. Atmosphere is the envelope of gases surrounding the Earth. Hydrosphere is all waters of Earth, including all bodies of water, water vapor in the atmosphere, ice frozen in glaciers and snow, as well as the water which permeates the lithosphere. The lithosphere is the outer shell of the Earth, consisting of the crust and upper mantle. It is about 100 kilometers, or 62 miles thick. This is what we are most familiar with, because it is what we are physically connected to. So much of life as we know it has interconnections between the forces of nature and thought. <laughs> thought? Sure, there is interrelationships in math, chemistry, and biology. Some of it is biotic, some abiotic. Their interrelationships are as tangible as you in my classroom today watching this video and applying your energies to the tasks that you will complete. We focus on insulation, more as we progress through this series. Watch for that. It is associated with the primary source of energy to this planet, the sun. Climate is our planet's energy delivery mechanism. Think of these as they contribute to the abiotic factors directly influencing ecosystems. From broad to narrow, the impact is significant and should never be ignored. It is of profound importance to recognize how these abiotic forces interact as climatic patterns are delivered across the ecological platform. We will dedicate ample attention to these interactions in some soon-to-come discussions. At the beginning of this investigation, we made a temporal wander to look back 650 million years ago to see Gondwana and then Pangaea shape these lands and discover how plate tectonics continued to sculpt, apply pressure, subduct new materials to the mantle, and force out new basalt, andesite, rhyolite, and acite lavas. Now you can decipher maps like this to find meaning about lands under your feet. We explore other views of the abiotic environment. We have a lot of scenes to create to express deeper understandings about cause and effect interactions. As you view this set of maps, consider the interactions of Earth systems. How does one system influence another? Hmm, what do you see? What features seem to appear across multiple maps, each expressed through a different lens? Ask yourself, why? Elevation gives texture to these topographic maps. As you look at this image, feel with your eyes the Rocky Mountain texture, the Florida Panhandle velvet, and the depression of eastern Washington's Great Basin. You know it as the settling pool of flood basalts poured here just uh, 17 million years ago, but you still see it now. Look to the precipitation across the country and recognize how its spread is important to plants and animals. Some areas became rainforests, others are deserts. However, precipitation is not taken as a singular resource. It needs to be considered based on temperature at time of delivery. 
This delivery is melded to how plants can use precipitation as a mix of nutrients. Those nutrients are found in soils converted to elements plants can use. Nutrients like phosphorus and potassium ensure crop development through the growth cycle. Thicker roots can suck up more nutrients at once, while longer roots can reach out further into the plant's rhyosphere to make use of all that is present in soil-based hydro solutions. Frozen precipitation, or snow, is temporally lost to plants, at least until it melts. Then it is soaked into soils where its time may be short or detained. Depending on the interactions of soils, slope, compaction, temperature, and a myriad of factors. Of course, at the other extreme, when it is too hot, it evaporates precipitation or puts plants into a lockdown to prevent devastating evapotranspiration. These abiotic interactions shape potentials of growth, energy capture, and options of life. A biome is that area of our planet classified according to the plants that live in it. Temperature, soil, and amount of light and water help determine what life exists in a biome. We name them based on the plants filling their niche on these lands. A biome is different from a landscape or an ecosystem. An ecosystem is the interaction of living and non-living things in an environment. A biome is a specific geographical area notable for the plant species living there. A biome can be made up of many landscapes and ecosystems. Not all scientists classify biomes in the same way. Some use broad classifications and count as few as six planetary biomes. At the same time, other analysts apply these criteria to render three dozen categories. I favor this depiction of biomes in North America. This is the representation of 14 different categories. Although this map shows distinct lines as boundaries, these lines are better represented as zones of transition, where changes in aspect are joined with steps into different plant growing environments, changes in climatic conditions, and combinations that deliver the fundamentals of a new biome. Dividing the world into a few ecological zones is a challenge, notably because of the small scale variations that exist everywhere on Earth, and because of the gradual changeover from one biome to another. Their boundaries must therefore be drawn arbitrarily, and their characterization made according to the average conditions that predominate. Biomes usually refer to the largest physiognomic classes of vegetation. The familiar biome chart can be expressed in terms of precipitation and temperature. Remember that lines on these figures are not hard and strict. They are meandering and fuzzy reactive to latitude and elevation. The distribution of vegetation types can be shown as a function of mean annual temperature and precipitation. Many analysts have done this, sometimes with temperature on the horizontal axis and sometimes with precipitation as the x-axis. Ecoregions or ecological systems or biomes are defined differently for various purposes. Many scientists have attempted to develop objective classifications for ecosystems modeled after Linnaeus's classification for species. However, there remains no standardized way for talking about the biogeo landforms. This makes it into a roll your own classification system, which is fine, as long as analysts working together use the same criteria. The importance of biomes cannot be overestimated. Biomes have changed and moved many times during the history of life on Earth. More recently, human activities have drastically altered these communities. Thus, conservation and preservation of biomes has become a major focus. Here is a 3D biome view. A common question asks, how do biomes affect each other? My response is to say that biomes do not really affect each other. They usually just gradually grade into one another, based on temperature and moisture conditions. Plant communities are the response indicator, not the causal force. Biomes are broadly defined by temperature and moisture conditions, and tend to change as you go away from the equator. They respond to temporal and spatial conditions where change is persistent. We see gradual changes where plants, fungus, and animals seek continuity of survival. Fundamentally, we use biome concepts to aid our understanding of management techniques suited to the lands we manage. 
In attempt to characterize the entire planet into a biome classification, Vili Kuestinen, University of Oklahoma, made this map depicting these 18 distinct biomes found around Earth. This presentation is clear, well-reasoned, and informative about the transitions made across each biome. Think about how wildlife responds within each biome. Biomes are distinct biological communities that have formed in response to a shared physical climate. Wildlife will genetically respond as well, fitting into responses showing their adaptations to the conditions of the environments they face. A biota is the total collection of organisms of a geological region or time period, from local geographic scales and instantaneous temporal scales all the way up to the whole planet and broad, time-based, spatial-temporal scales. The biotas of the Earth make up the biosphere. Keep that one in mind. The biosphere is the collection of all biomes. Biomes are made up of landscapes, which are collections of ecosystems. Notice I have changed the biome map from what was made at the University of Oklahoma to this one made at the University of Tennessee. Within this context, we have about 15 discrete biomes. I often use this presentation because it shows decent specificity about the region where I often work. This is critical to our professional world as we express the lands we interact with. Name the biomes you refer to and understanding will follow you. A biome is an ecosystem or a group of ecosystems that can be characterized by its vegetation, plant and animal life, climate, geology, elevation, and rainfall. Biomes are large ecosystem units, so while a puddle may be considered an ecosystem, the Pacific Ocean would be considered a biome. In most cases, the plants and animals in a biome will have special adaptations that make living in that community most successful. So when ecologists study a particular plant or animal, they generally study its entire biome to have a better understanding of the role that species plays in its community. When you look at pictures of Earth from space, what's the first thing that you see? A blue marble, as some have described it. A water world, where oceans and swirls of white cloud dominate. But most of us will then have our attention drawn to the shapes imprinted on its surface. The continents. And they come in many colors. The white of Antarctica, the beige of the Sahara, the light green of grasslands, and the darker shades of our planet's forests in their many forms. So many of these colors that give the world its look are the result of trillions of individual plants growing upon the surface. Which plants grow where is determined by many factors, with climate being the most dominant. Desert and scrubland, savanna, prairie and steppe, tundra and taiga, woodland and rainforest, they are at the base of almost every food chain of every animal, the habitats that sustain all other life forms and ourselves. Collectively, they are known as the biomes, the living landscapes of Earth. This brings us to step in the landscapes existing here. These are defined to the level of the biome they exist in. But this takes it one step further into specificity of how the mesoenvironment is characterized. It is super important that you do not take this too far into specifics. Plant communities come next, but the landscape is visually recognizable as a change in plant composition. When you see it, you will know what has happened because of a difference in how plants can succeed. Landscapes are spatially heterogeneous geographic areas characterized by diverse interacting patches, ranging from relatively natural terrestrial and aquatic systems, such as forests, grasslands, and lakes, to human-dominated environments, including agricultural and urban settings. Many authors suggest the study of landscape patterns and functioning should focus on the two most fundamental measures of pattern, that is, composition, what and how much is there, and configuration expressed as connectivity and spatial arrangements. 
In this respect, even simple binary maps generated by neutral landscape models can produce a surprisingly rich array of spatial configurations in this pattern transition space, defined by composition and configuration. In general, at similar composition values, there is a transition from more to fewer fragmented landscapes with increasing connectivity, and from less to sharper contrast with non-focal cover types. The pattern transition space is inclusive of all possible combinations of composition and connectivity. Landscape ecology and natural history have a long tradition of interest in the spatial patterning and geographic distribution of organisms. The latitudinal and altitudinal distribution of vegetative zones was first described by Alexander van Humboldt at the turn of the 18th century. He is considered the father of ecology and his work provided a major impetus to studies of the geographic distribution of plants and animals. Throughout the 19th century, botanists and zoologists described the spatial distributions of various taxa, particularly as they related to macroclimatic factors, the biome, focusing first on temperature and precipitation. The emerging view was that strong interdependencies among climate, biota, and soil lead to long-term stability of the landscape in the absence of climatic changes. Ecosystems or ecological systems, or just ecoregions, are defined based on intended uses. Many scientists have attempted to develop objective classifications for ecosystems modeled after classification for species. However, there remains no standardized way for taking out the biogeo landforms of Earth. Again, we need to share with our colleagues which systems we are using. Aldo Leopold, forester and wildlife manager, outdoorsman, ecologist, philosopher and practical idealist, interpreter of nature, pioneer in wilderness preservation. Wow, he taught an ethic of the land and by his teaching, writing, and example, gave added depth, breadth, and insight to conservationism. He helped establish the Gila Wilderness as our nation's first national forest. He was the founder of the Wilderness Society. 111 years ago, in 1909, Aldo Leopold first traveled to the American Southwest. What he discovered in the land and in himself changed the world. His was a holistic approach to wildlife and natural resource conservation. This is recognition of seeing the forest for the trees. Quote, when an ecosystem is good, then everything in it is good, even if you don't get it. End quote. That is one Leopoldism. The whole is more than merely the sum of its parts. We always come back to the biotic and abiotic levels. When you know these concepts, you will apply them to the lands you encounter to see the interrelationships between each component. Recognize the abiotic forces can think nothing. These are reactions to natural forces. Wildlife react with their inherent responses to natural events. Take a look at this ecosystem again. We have been on this scene before, but now I want you to consider this through the lens of viewing ecosystems. This embraces all the organisms in a given area, as well as the physical environment in which they live. Remember, this is all biotic and abiotic systems in the view. Trees, shrubs, grasses, fungi, mold, microorganisms, and amoeba. They are all living and they are part of the biotic side. On the abiotic side, we have the rocks, soil, dead trees, water in the dirt, in the hypohaic stream bed, and that old boot the cowboy lost 200 years ago. These are the abiotic factors of things like climate, weather, water, and sunlight delivery to each facet of the surface. Abiotic factors are non-living things in an ecosystem, so anything in an ecosystem that is, well, not living, is an abiotic factor. Recognize how we start to describe the ecosystem in this photo. It was K in the North American Biomes screen we use. This is the one from the University of Tennessee. This is how we begin sharing this vocabulary. It is obviously in the autumn season when this image was taken, and there are many different species, most existing within the same ecosystem. 
Hmm, but look to the top of this ridge line in the background. There is a shift in species apparently growing there. Maybe it is a transition from hardwoods to conifers. At the very least, this signifies the step into a new gradation from central hardwood forest to northern hardwood forest. That would be a shift in the biome, but it may be more appropriate to look first to the shift in the ecosystem. This is where the first transition will be seen. Biotic communities are groups of interdependent organisms inhabiting the same region and interacting with each other. While these are often thought of as singular species definitions, they are more importantly not singular. This considers interactions within species as well as between species. This includes interactions at spatial scales of competition, from treetops to interactions at all levels of competition. Together, the populations of all the different species that live together in an area make up what's called an ecological community. For instance, if we wanted to describe the ecological community of a coral reef, we would include the populations of every single type of organism we could find, from coral species to fish species, to the single-celled photosynthetic algae living in the corals. For a healthy reef, that comes out to be a load of different species. We will do this analysis within each ecosystem we encounter to discover the communities we interact with. I have slipped in phrases of temporal and spatial scales. This is where your clear eyes are able to look through the lens of a time machine as you consider what was there before and what will be coming. Ideally, you will not be caught in the trap of the time traveler. You need to consider interactions happening here and now. Now is the temporal scale to focus on current time interactions, while the here places attention on this place where the interactions are witnessed. Keep this specific perpetual lens focused as you open it up to discover what you are really looking into. It is the trees, the shrubs under them. It's the mosses, grasses, and weeds living there. But you need to look further to see mosses, lichen, and fungi above and below surface levels. Look for the birds nesting or feeding in this cafe to discover the herbivores eating those plants and the carnivores feasting on some takeout meals. <laughs> here you will combine the biotic and abiotic into the collection of what makes here be known as here. A plant community is a collection or association of plant species within a geographical area. These form relatively uniform patches, distinguishable from neighboring patches of different vegetation types. The components of each plant community are influenced by soil type, topography, climate, and often by human disturbance. The living organisms in an environment are called biotic components. Biotic factors in ecology can be classified into three groups. Producers, known as autotrophs, are usually green plants that carry out photosynthesis to, to produce food. They are the genesis of energy capture from the sun to the terrestrial systems of Earth. This is where the action happens to make our life possible. Consumers are the heterotrophs, which directly or indirectly depends on photosynthetic output of the primary producers. Some landscapes really put on the photosynthetic growth. Others are struggling to make plant growth happen. There are three consumer groups, primary consumer, secondary consumer, and tertiary consumer. We can slip in another often overlooked cadre, the decomposers or detrivores. These include bacteria and fungi that carry out decomposition, the breakdown of the remains of dead organisms including animal waste products into simpler inorganic substances to be used by plants. Without the detrivores, our lands would be overrun by the carcasses and dead plants from eons of time. We should never forget the meat eaters of this pack. Critters like the coyote and stellar jays, bears and wolves are present to eat plants and animals. These are the omnivores. Stellar jays' favorite food is acorns from the oak trees, but some other things they eat are fruits, nuts, seeds, insects, mice, frogs, small birds, eggs, beech nuts, and caterpillars. Huh. Make sure you caught that nuance about them eating insects, mice, and frogs. This verifies them as eaters of plants and other animals, 
Therefore, they are omnivores too. A big brown bat is shown here, and those are a little different, as they are insectivores. Sure, they can digest those bugs, but I am pretty sure they are not vampires. They are just drawn that way. Be cautious of applying the name carnivore versus omnivore. Just because you think the coyote ate some juniper or surface berries, because you find them in its scat, that does not necessarily mean they are capable of digesting those berries. I have seen these in coyote scat and verified they were not digested at all. They were just present in the craw of the forest grouse our coyote feasted on yesterday. It made it through the mass processing system the coyote calls its stomach and intestines. The coyote is a carnivore. Population members are all of one species that live in the same area and interact with each other. They are genetically related and carry on the genome by virtue of living together. From tiny viruses and bacteria, unrecognized for millennia, to blue whales weighing 200 tons, and fungi that spread for hundreds of hectares underground, the diversity and extent of life on Earth is dazzling. In its life and reproduction, every organism is shaped by and, in turn, shapes its environment. Ecological scientists study organism-environment interactions across ecosystems of all sizes, ranging from microbial communities to the Earth as a whole. This genetic shell captures how populations differ from other populations of the same species, separated by space and time. Again, looking back to North American biomes and Pacific coastal evergreen forest, you begin to form a concept of this association of plants, the environment, and animals who live here. To test a hypothesis, I have collected seed from this forest population to try and grow it in a North Idaho ecosystem. The seed sprouted, but they could not survive the winters or the timing of precipitation delivery. A couple of trees lived to maturity, but they never made viable seed. Therefore, they were reproductively unsuccessful. The genetic adaptation to enable survival in the changed biome was missing. The genes of a population directly influence their long-term sustainability and vigor. When the population drops to critically low levels, the population is less vigorous and less successful. Variability within a single species gives the ability to respond to a broad range of changes. Dealing with an endangered species, this is where you start looking into its ability to stage a comeback as their population tries to grow in numbers and genetic resilience. Think about the northern spotted owl versus gray wolves. How broad is the mobility and adaptive range of each species? This is a great place to begin consideration of population dynamics. Now we arrive at the discussion of organisms. Here are the individuals of species we can delve into most. Many academic studies focus on this specific level of investigation. When we make statements about species, we are giving it more than just a happenstance comment about morphological similarity or sharing space in the same ecosystem. This recognition verifies how the species breeds to produce viable offspring. Viable offspring means the young can thrive and survive, and that can also breed to produce viable offspring. Make it a generational thing. This might happen with a tree species like Douglas fir collected from different biomes. Those individuals are from the same genus and species, Pseudosuga menzinsii, but separate varieties. Menzinsia in western Washington, but variety Glauca in eastern Washington. It might happen as mule deer breed with white-tailed deer, sharing space in the same ecosystem and community. They can produce offspring, but we will investigate how the males of this union are usually lost in vitro, and the females are often sterile. These are not viable offspring. Consider this trek from biosphere into biomes, landscapes, ecosystems, communities, populations, and the individual of the species you seek. This progression of discovery is the basis of ecology, environmental analysis, and natural resource management.
you have initiated on a pathway that can take you as broad as a planet or as deep as the smallest microbe buried deep within an ocean. This is your discovery journey. Roll your own flavor and make it personal. These are the topics we will explore throughout this journey. We started with image of my granddaughter. Here is me and my father. Hierarchy in our environment is not so dissimilar from a hierarchy in a family. 